Welcome to Conservation Conversations. I'm Sean O'Brien, the president and CEO of NatureServe. And this month, I'm really excited to have Lowell Bear with us. Uh, Lowell has been a tireless advocate for conservation over a remarkable 60 year career. It's kind of amazing to have a career that goes for 60 yes. years. Um, Lowell's an attorney and an author and an entrepreneur, and of course, a dedicated conservation advocate. Um, you can look at uh, look up his books online and uh, see his incredible biography of, of books. And we're talking to him today because um, his latest book uh, about the history of the Endangered Species Act has come out. This is a multi-volume uh, tome, um, and we're going to talk a little bit about the, the first book and then some of the history of the ESA and, and what that means. Um, but I also want to give a little bit of context on Endangered Species Act before we get going. Uh, first of all, it was passed December 28th, 1973, with amazing bipartisan support, which I think is an important thing to bring up uh, today. Um, so we're just shy of the 50th anniversary of the Endangered Species Act, which is somewhat coincidental. Uh, we're about the 50th anniversary of NatureServe. The Endangered Species Act is all about endangered species and protecting endangered species. And that's what NatureServe is all about. We are all about the data and information necessary to protect endangered species in North America. So we're really excited the, about the coincidence of those two dates um, and to have this opportunity to, uh, to talk to Lowell about it. So one more little piece of context. In the United States, we consider 34% of plant species and 40% of animal species to be at risk of extinction. We don't use the technical term endangered because we try to reserve that for species that are listed on the endangered species list. Um, but this adds up to um, something like 25,000-ish species that are endangered in the United States. Um, only uh, about 16 or 1700 are officially listed on the endangered species list. So we'll talk a little bit about that and the politics of how things get listed. And we'll talk a little bit about um, this issue of species being endangered. So in the history of the planet, we have these mass extinction events, including the one that everybody's familiar with, um, with the asteroid wiping out the dinosaurs. And we tend to think of that as an event that happened sort of in a moment in time because it's an asteroid strike. But in That's fact, correct. it took a long time for the, all of the implications of that to play out. Mm -hmm. And in the um, final chapter of your of the book, you talk about some of the statistics that are out there about what's happening right now. And depending on which scientists you're listening to, extinction rates today in the Anthropocene, as you said, are between 100, 1,000, and 10,000 times greater than the history of extinctions throughout the, uh, the history of life on Earth, including faster than when the dinosaurs went extinct. Correct. It's, it's mind-boggling. Um, and in the United States, we have a tool that is intended to try and help us slow the pace of this extinction. And so if you can just tell us, so I think everybody's heard of the Endangered Species Act, but probably don't understand it gets significance and how it came to be. And you have a really great history in the book of sort of some of the things that got us to the place where we could even conceive of an Endangered Species Act, much less get it passed in the way that it was. And so I'm going to give you a chance to give us that history um, so that people can understand just what an amazing uh, law this is. Well, um, it, it really began when the scientists uh, and uh, more informed uh, laymen uh, and conservationists began to recognize that we were losing species. And this goes back to the Eisenhower era, just after World War II, when the troops were coming home and um, uh, Truman was still in office at the time, Eisenhower followed him. And the scientists began to publish papers about how many species we were losing. And, they, and, and we know of the, 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 the popular one, of course, is the passenger pigeon, pigeon and the Carolina parakeet. But along with that were others that were, there were massive imports from hunting primarily, but also for commercial use uh, uh, of tigers uh, from both uh, from Africa. 
uh, as well as polar bears from uh, uh, the, the, the the Arctic, above the Arctic, and um, uh, the whooping cranes was close to extinction, uh, as was the uh, American alligator and several others. And Congress began to to to, to pay attention to what the scientists were saying, um, and the era of I call it the Green Revolution, the era of the sixties and seventies. Um, the people of America began to um, recognize uh, and be concerned about what the scientists were telling them and what the, the what the future pretended. Uh, what would it be like without a polar bear in existence uh, or tigers, et cetera? So they they really, uh, during that green period, the 60s and 70s, uh, rose up, got Congress's attention. And John Dingle really, John Dingle Jr. really led the charge uh, to create the first Endangered Species Act to address this cons- public concern, which was in 1966. Um, there were some, it was a, a short law. It really didn't have any impact. It was more of a policy statement. Mm-hmm. So then in 69, they amended it to add um, uh, uh, imports. The, the 66 law only covered U.S. Uh, species, whereas the 69 Act uh, said that to bring uh, endangered uh, species that were considered endangered uh, into the United States would be illegal. However, that, again, really didn't add a lot to the force of the law, and John and others recognized that. So in 72, um, they uh, were now into the Nixon era. And um, his policy people in the White House, John Ehrlichman and John Whitaker, worked with CEQ, which was brand new at the time. It was formed in 1970. And uh, that's the Council uh, of, uh, of Environmental Quality. And Russell Train was the first one to head, up, head that up. And um, so... Um, He and his chief scientist, uh, Dr. Lee Talbot, began to work with the Department of Interior uh, under the guise of, uh, and direction of the White House to come up with a stronger law. So they had a law passed. Uh, uh, they, they proposed a law. The Democrats were in control of the Congress at the time. They proposed a law. The Republican administration proposed a law. They had extensive hearings in 72. And then it, the, both proposals were rewritten to address the concerns they heard during the hearings. And the final uh, bill was crafted in, um, in, in uh, uh, the fall of 1973, passed the House and the Senate, and was sent to the White House, and almost didn't get signed. Yeah, it's so interesting. Um, and I do think that this, um, the fact that this was a bipartisan effort, and it came both from the executive branch and the legislative branch, and was so universally accepted at the time as important and necessary is really quite remarkable when you think about the politics around the Endangered Species Act today. Today, two different worlds, two totally different worlds. And you um, and you've been involved in some ways with basically every administration since. Yes. And so you've seen the different ways that the act has been approached and implemented. Yes. Are there any moments that stand out particularly to you in that time period? Well, yes, the, the worst one and the most troubling one was when uh, James Watt was appointed Secretary of Interior under Reagan, and he basically shut the program down. There was no listing at all, no listings. The whole thing, the program was frozen when James Watt was Secretary of Interior and, uh, of course, made all of us panic. Yeah. Um, but uh, that stands out specifically. Thank God he, was, he only lasted a couple of years. <laughs> so, um, the Endangered Species Act is intended to get the government to identify species that are in danger of going extinct, bald eagle being a famous example, and you mentioned some others like whooping crane, um, and then have some tools and some power to restore these species and try and bring them back to healthy populations. Um there's some species out there in the world. Um, there's the key deer, which um, native habitat is in the 
the Florida Keys, um, which would be a fairly challenging location at this point to try and reintroduce a species and have it have a sustainable population. Um, so full recovery of a species like that within its native range would be pretty challenging, especially with climate change and development and all those other things. So in a situation like that, what does it mean to recover a species like the key deer to be able to have them delisted in the future or to just have a healthy population? Yes. Uh, what you're really posing is a question of what do you do with species that just have no hope of recovery? Either the population is too low or they're geographically bound and cannot be moved and tra translocated because of, uh, of the climate and the habitat that they live in. You'd, it'd be hard to duplicate that elsewhere. So what do you do? This is a, a, a question that the scientists at Fish and Wildlife Service wrestle with daily. What do you do with species that have no hope? The law says, the 1973 law says, that we shall save all species. Mm. There's no room for argument at all. It's a very strict law. What, what they do is, if they're functionally extinct, functionally extinct, they can delist them and just let them go. Or if there is a hope, any sort of a hope, they try to save the them through relocation, translocation, genetics, technology, and, and what when a petition a petition is presented to the Fish and Wildlife Service, um, they have to determine within 90 days whether there is a likelihood that they could become listed. Um, and it's either a yes or a no, or um, they can say it's warranted but precluded by higher priority listing. And that's the the back door, the out that they, they that they do use, but it is the, that question that you posed, um, which applies not just to the key deer but other species as well, For sure. is uh, is perhaps probably the most vexing of all, because of the rigidity of the law, which says thou shalt save every species. Yeah. So we in in a specific case of the key deer potentially a some sort of a preserve or reserve could be set up to save them, but they would not be, as you used the term, functionally extinct because they wouldn't be in the environment. They wouldn't be contributing to the functioning of a healthy ecosystem in mm -hmm. their in their native habitat. So functional extinction is an interesting concept to talk about because there's the literal extinction. So as you mentioned, the passenger pigeon or the dodo or some other species that are sort of very iconic in there having gone extinct. But then we have other species where there are so few of them that they're not providing any service, any function in the ecosystem on a grand scale any longer. Um, and I just, we, we should probably define that for people because it is a sort of a technical discrepancy, um, but we have brought things back from that place. The California condor mm -hmm. is down to, I think, single digits. And oh, yeah. I think it was down to 10 or 12. Yeah. And now there are over 500 California condors living in the wild and breeding in the wild as well as in captivity. That's a remarkable story of recovery facilitated by, I assume, <laughs> the Endangered Species Act. That's correct. It's that you could you could do a book just on the condors recovery alone, because yeah. they captured all ten or ten or twelve of them, and then put them at Patuxent, uh, put them part of them at Patuxent. They kept them separated, so if disease hit one one pocket, the the other group would be still sustained. Right. Yeah. It's 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 remarkable, and yet um, we know from uh, nature serve data that. Um, I'm going to pull up our biodiversity and focus report um, that according to the definition that we use for determining if something is um, at risk, that there's about 16 or 17,000 species of plants that are at risk of extinction. Now, some of those are, you know, could go either way, depending on different things. So let's uh, cut out the ones that are just sort of vulnerable and stick to the ones that are what we call imperiled or critically imperiled. And you're still talking about probably 7,000 species in the United States that are scientifically demonstrably at risk of extinction. 
And yet the endangered species list has, I think, just under 1,700 species total, including plants and animals on it. So what's, what's the discrepancy there? Why aren't there more things listed? Well, part of it is funding. I mean, that's the basic problem is, is the personnel required uh, to analyze a, a particular species uh, health and viability and um, uh, uh, determine whether it should be listed or not. I mean, there's just not enough funds available to the Fish and Wildlife Service to, to do that. Now, many states have their own Endangered Species Act, and they pick up a lot of the uh, of those that the, the service does not um, uh, list or mm -hmm. deal with. But um, it's it basically comes down to funding and personnel, which is why a, a law that's been proposed, uh, the Recovering America's Wildlife Yeah, the, yeah, the Recovering uh, uh, of America's Wildlife. Uh, it is, I think we're in the fourth Congress now where it has been up again for, for uh, enactment. would provide $1.3 billion a year to the service and the states to beef up that very, uh, the void we just talked about. Yeah, Recovering America's Wildlife Act is... Uh, you know, if the Endangered Species Act is the most important environmental law to date, and RAWA would be certainly the most important one in a generation or two because of the funding that it would provide to yes. not only um, endangered species, but to all aspects of uh, conservation, um, including fish and game species and other things. So it would. Um, and non, not, non uh, species not at risk. Correct. So that's a, one of the challenges of a law like the Endangered Species Act, where it doesn't provide a funding mechanism. And if you don't then provide the funding in subsequent years, things like the monarch butterfly, which has seen something like a 90% decline in its population, is still in limbo in terms of how it might be uh, treated under the Endangered Species Act. Yes, that's correct. Let me give you... There was a study done a couple of years ago by uh, Jake Lee and uh, Jacob uh, Malcolm, and they determined from their 2018 study that a quarter of the listed species lacked a recovery plan, and half of those uh, recovered plans were, were, were 20 years old or older. Then in their study, they discovered that only 3% of the recovered of, of, of recovery plans correctly projected the time frame for recovery. And it's very, very hard to determine when you when you lose the species, well, how long is it going to take to recover so its population is viable and sustainable and will continue on its own without the help of a conservation uh, a plan? And um, uh, those are remarkable statistics, but again, it goes right back to funding. Yeah. Uh, now, in the original debate in 72 and 73, uh, there was great discussion about whether plants should be in or not as part of the Endangered Species Act. And Congress decided that they needed uh, some better mm, science and, and study of plants to determine whether they should or should not be included. Uh, as threatened or endangered species or species at risk. So so it came later. And it's always been sort of the stepchild of the of the um, Endangered Species Act and their administrators. That's the, la that's the last thing they look at is the, the health of plants and, and the, whether or not they are at risk. And yet the, the Endangered Species Act, it says right at, it, it's the very first mission statement uh, even before they get to animal, they talk about habitat, sustaining our ecosystems. It's right in the law. It's right up front. And yet they left plants out uh, until the First Amendment because of that. And for some reason, assist, uh, systemically, it got into the minds of the administrators of the act, and they still drag their feet and put that in a second position. It's It's sort of incredible. And it's one of the amazing things about recovering America's wildlife act is we will get a definition of wildlife that includes plants uh, yes. across the country. Some States, 
incorporate plants into their state wildlife action plans and in their Endangered Species Act, um, but not all states do. And so this will be um, an amazing change if we can get uh, America's Wildlife Act passed. Um, and and there's definitely the disparity among plants and animals and their listings and how they get treated. And yet it, it, the, the public is not aware of the fact that 50% of our drugs, 50% of the drugs that are prescribed are derived from plants, plants, period. Some are endangered, some are not. But still, 50% of our drugs come yeah. from Yeah, I wanted to actually, you, you sort of got to what a question I wanted to ask you, which was like, okay, so why do we care if something goes extinct? You know, what are the what what are the arguments for preserving species that are essentially in some cases functionally extinct or are so rare as to you know only exist in one place? Like why should why should we care? Well, um, uh, Justice Berger wrote the decision on the snail garden in 1970. His decision was written in 78, I believe. The lawsuit was filed in 75. It finally got to the Supreme Court in 78. And his, Justice Berger, he was Chief Justice at the time, um, was very clear, that, and I wish I had the quote right in front of me, but he said something effective. There, there, there are in those plants and animals that we haven't even looked at unknown cures for disease that we're not even aware of. We haven't gotten to them yet. And that's one of the reasons his interpretation of the breadth and depth of that act uh, uh, it was recognized as such by the Supreme Court. They, they really focused on the potential that plants and animals had in, 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 in necessities. One of them is drugs mm -hmm. and medical cures, but the other one is the food supply. Um, our food supply is at risk right now, and people don't even know that, don't recognize it, because most foods, most most crops require pollination by bees or butterflies or birds. Few people recognize that as they struggle to survive, like the monarch butterfly, it, you said it was 90%, but the monarch is just that uh, uh, the uh, uh, canary in the mine shaft, it's really, it affects all butterflies. Uh, the bee population, uh, there's the mm, the domestic bee population where you see them in hives and they carry them around the country and so forth. Uh, they have lost 45% of, of the bees in that particular population over the last uh, five years. And of the of the the, the, na the native bee population, it's like a, it's like twenty eight percent that we've lost. And so, and, and in the bird population, just look at the bird population. There was a study done by the by the by it wasn't Audubon, but it was the Bird Conservancy, mm -hmm. and we have lost three billion birds, which is twenty five percent of our bird population from just 12 families of birds in the last 10 years. Well, there you are with the butterflies, with the bees, and with the birds, the three basic pollinators. Mm -hmm. And they are all, uh, I don't want to say in a crisis mode, but some of them are, some of the species are. And, and yet the American public assumes that through technology uh, and, and better architecture, uh, uh, Agriculture practices. We will figure out how to grow more, you know, grow more food to, to get around this crisis. But there is a hidden crisis that people have not even recognized or really talked about. And the food supply has a couple of components. Uh, one is, um, according to our data, uh, thirty-seven percent of bee species in the United States are at risk of extinction, which is a huge number. There's also things like flower flies that do. Um, pollination and there's huge risks in flower flies and the domestic bees like you were talking about the european honeybee mm -hmm. um, they have their own set of problems even though they're essentially mm -hmm. almost like a manufactured product at this point in terms of the beehives that travel around the country they have their own set of problems that are causing declines there that you mentioned um and then there's the 
essentially the monoculture that is so much modern agriculture. And if some disease comes into our corn supply or our wheat supply, and we don't have a way to fight it, where are we going to look for ways to fight it? We're going to look at wild relatives of those crop species to mm-hmm. look for genetic protection against those diseases, which is what has happened um, over and over what you were talking about with medicines. Nature, mm-hmm. finds, nature finds a way. It's had yeah. millions of years to do this. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. so I, I think a lot about that with the crop wild relatives as well. And G- G- the GMO reference is, part, is very much part of that. Absolutely. Yes. So, Lil, you've been uh, in this business of um, being involved in politics and conservation for a very long time. I want to talk a little bit about your inspiration for getting involved and what, you know, how did you become a conservation oriented person? And then talk a little bit about um, sort of maybe some of the changes that you've seen through your through your career in the way that we talk about and think about uh, conservation, especially in the United States. Well, I'm 83 years old now. I was raised on a farm in Indiana. We had a Granddad had several farms, but the one we lived on was a, was about 120 acres, and it was basically a grain farm. And we had a, a herd of cows that we had anywhere from 17 to 27 cows that had to be milked morning and night. But but since most of the land was in in grain production, we needed pasture for those cows. Mm-hmm. So what we would do as kids is we would take the cows and put them out on the roadsides. And there was a lot of grass out there. And so we would take all of our cows and put them out on the road, the gravel road, and we would have to stay with them all day. Well, take a kid who's curious about things and put him out where he has to stay out there in in, in, in the, the roadside habitat for, you know, eight hours a day. Well, he becomes curious about well, what are these bugs? What are these butterflies? What's this weed? You know, this is a Canadian thistle. I've got to cut it out, et cetera. And so you really begin, if you're curious, like my mind was, to get connected to the smallest little things in nature. So that's how it started. And then when I became older and, and, and began to go, on, uh, I, I was a sportsman. Uh, and I'm, you know, I'm not ashamed of that. I don't hunt anymore, but I used to hunt pretty regularly and trekked not only from the North Pole all the way down to Baja. <laughs> and, then, and, and then I went, I spent a lot of time in Europe and Asia, in Mongolia, and then um, uh, mm-hmm. um, the Altai Mountains. And again, I was with biologists. I, was, I actually paid for it teams of biologists to do some studies when uh, I was part of the Wild Sheep Foundation, which I was one of the founders of back in the uh, early 70s. And they asked us to help them establish conservation programs that included hunting that would pay substantial fees that would then offset the cost of the conservation programs. And uh, so I, I had a broad, broad, both as a kid and then later in life, as I trekked around the, the world, and the more time I spent with it and with the biologists there, the more I began to really, really uh, have a basis for w- what I do today in terms of writing. Because there are very few lawyers that have had that extensive uh, exposure to the natural world across the world. And that's what's given me the impetus to be not only an advocate, but, but, a, but a writer. I used to the write. Uh, uh, chapters for books uh, and read a lot of uh, articles um, and uh, I finally got tired of that and said you know I'm breaking down I can't physically continue my my active life here in Washington running around at the White House and the Interior Department and Capitol Hill and and uh, uh, Department of Agriculture and so as I was slowing down I sped up my writing and that's really where the the, the, the root of where all the books came from is uh, rather than just sit around and, and go slowly into retirement, uh, I was furious about trying to record as much as I could and relate it to, to my experiences abroad and interpret what I saw. Right. And so what... Um, That's you know, a long-winded response to your question. 
Yeah, no, that's a great actual segue. So I just wanted to remind people that the Codex of the Endangered Species Act is available now. You can find it at local bookstores, Barnes and Noble, Amazon, places like that. Um, it's a, but available electronically or on paper. Um, it's quite readable. Um, it's incredibly well documented. The number of footnotes in this book rivals any scientific paper, but they don't get in the way. The, the book that's out now, can I hold it up? Yes, of course. This just arrived yesterday, right? It's hot off the press. This is the first time I've been able to pre premiere this book or pre preview this book. Let's see. Can you see it? Yep. It, it says the Codex of the Endangered Species Act, the first 50 years by Lowell E. Bear. Volume one. Volume one, those, of course. And those three critters on the front, the cute little critters, are um, black-footed ferrets. Um, and so I wanted to... Talk about, we you know, we've talked about some depressing topics and climate change and habitat destruction and all of these things and the number of species that aren't being protected by the Endangered Species Act. And you've been in this business for 60 years. You're 83 years old. You've seen an enormous amount of change and you've been paying attention that whole time. So, but you're also constantly working for the future. So obviously you have hope. And I want to like, tell me about your hope and what, Keep, lets you maintain that hope for the future that we can uh, persevere and we should persevere in the face of this crisis. My hope is bound up with my greatest frustration today. And that is getting the attention of the American public to the biodiversity crisis and how it's affected by climate change and the role that the ESA plays in um, that dynamic. It, there are three factors that all work together. Uh, the crisis is here, and it's because of the loss of species, the loss of organisms. And how do you how do you um, get the American, the average American public, uh, to to listen and understand that, and then begin to become proactive? in their lives because they're, they're, they're flooded with uh, media, with false information, with elections, with keeping their job, they're starting school for the kids, uh, their mortgages, uh, will they have a job tomorrow, et cetera. They're so, uh, life is so complicated today. And to get through, to get through where the American public to understand the crisis like you and I and others in our world do uh, is my biggest frustration. Mm -hmm. But my hope is that I and others, by constantly being on the stump and have and being in, in, involved in talking to the public, will finally get their attention. And I don't know what it's going to take. Right. And so that my hope is that that collectively, perhaps we'll have a voice loud enough that to begin to start paying attention and climate change and the, 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 the tough aspects of climate change, like the floods, the wildfires and so forth, perhaps that's going to turn their attention. I don't know what, what it is, yeah. but that's my hope is something will begin to turn their attention. So more summers like this summer and the kinds of uh, weather events that are affecting people's lives as people, but also, as you said, affecting uh, nature and wildlife. Yes. And people are, I think, appreciating that and seeing that more uh, in the case of the Hawaiian uh, wildfire. There's a lot of talk about the impact on uh, nature there and some endangered species. And so people are mm -hmm. starting to pay attention to that as well as the human tragedy involved. An, an example I've used is I took a young man. Um, he's not my grandson, but he's my surrogate grandson. Uh, out one night, um, it was during vacation last year, To he and his sister wanted to go out and, at night and look at the stars. And I said, well, take a jar along. We'll collect some lightning bugs. They didn't know what I was talking about. This is upper Michigan. And they didn't know what I was talking about. And then I explained to them, when, when I grew up on the farm, there were lightning bugs all over. We'll try to find a lightning bug today or a monarch butterfly. Yeah. And and maybe it's examples like that that will get the public's attention. I don't know. Yeah. Well, Lowell, I want to thank you for all the work that you've done throughout your career on this issue. And also thank you for taking the 
time because I know it was an immense labor to pull together the information for the first two volumes of the book. And I'm really excited that you're making the sort of more popular press uh, version that'll come out next year. And maybe we'll talk again um, at that point about that book. But thank you for all that you've done for uh, for the for conservation uh, across the world in your career. Well, thank you for giving me the opportunity to to uh, uh, speak to the general public. Absolutely. Uh, this is I'm again Sean O'Brien with Nature Serve, and we've been talking with Lowell Bear about the Codex of the Endangered Species Act and the history of the Endangered Species Act and how that uh, can be utilized to protect species um, across our country. Um, of course, Nature Serve works all across North America, and this has been mostly focused on the United States, but that's uh, similar similar issues in Canada, of course. Um, Nature Serve uh, earlier this year produced a report called Biodiversity in Focus, which you can find on our website and is quite complementary to information in uh, the Codex. And some Nature Serve maps are included in Lowell's book. So we appreciate that and the attention that that will bring to, to some of our work. And if you're listening still, uh, please consider making a donation to Nature Serve. We're a nonprofit organization and we depend on. Uh, the good graces of people out there to uh, support our work to protect endangered species all across North America and across the world. So uh, thanks for listening and thank you again to Lowell for being on the show.